Clark. I'm an instructional technologist at Muhlenberg College. This is Hi, I'm Jenny Azard. I'm an instructional designer at Muhlenberg College. <laughs> and uh, the room isn't um, maybe configured in the best way for a hands-on workshop, but we're gonna we're gonna make it work. This handout is accessible through that short link there. And then from there, everything that we do today should be hyperlinked to make it easy. If everything goes according to plan, uh, we hope our author of the article we're gonna annotate will be joining us live. That would be really exciting. There's a short slide deck and we're gonna break twice from the presentation to do some hands-on stuff in the middle. So I'm, I'm just curious if anybody has used any online or web-based annotation uh, tool at all, if anyone has experience, even an article on medium.com or something like that. A little bit. The idea of uh, social annotation isn't new. Uh, as you may think, the sort of landmark article in the Atlantic came out in 1945, and within this sort of vision of the Mimex, there was this notion of collaborative annotation or shared annotation on, uh, I guess, essentially microfilm or dry photography. Uh, Ted Nelson has uh, some sort of uh, far out ideas in, around the Xanadu project that was very heavily invested in this notion of shared annotation of text. The first specification for the Mosaic browser actually had an annotation feature um, planned, but it just missed release. Um, they concentrated instead on building the, the hypertextuality uh, and uh, and held back, and, and perhaps that decision is the reason why uh, we're just now getting around to uh, tools that are approaching uh, something close to shared annotation. Uh, there was a project called Third Voice in the early 2000s uh, that shuttered its project by 2008, but there's a lot of movement in this direction. I think uh, the strongest evidence of that is the W3C has a web annotation working group and released a specification in February of this year. So if it gets incorporated into the web specifications, one can imagine that future generations of browsers will have this feature just sort of built in. Um, what really I think uh, started a lot of this is the, the modern generation of browsers with HTML5, but also uh, JavaScript libraries, jQuery, things like that really make this a lot more feasible than it has been in the past. So um, with that little bit of history, let's install hypothesis. What do you say? Sound good? I would, I would recommend that we work in the Chrome browser. If uh, folks need to get that installed, there should be a link. Yeah, there is. Uh, right here from this handout if you need to get uh, Chrome installed. And uh, once you do that, um, it's just a simple matter of going to the Chrome extensions and searching for Hypothesis. And they're calling it the web store these days. But from this search box right here, you can search for Hypothesis. The, the thing that's important to point out is um, Hypothesis is like a lot of um, resources on the web, it is a website as well as an extension. So you could go to hypothes.is and create an account, and then from that direction, they'll also point you to how to install the extension. So um, you can go either through the browser or through the Hypothesis website. And so in this way, Hypothesis is similar to things like uh, Flipboard or Instapaper or Pinboard or any of these things that sort of integrate with the web, but they have a sort of standalone account that you'll create. Um, so after you've installed the extension, uh, we'll go to the Hypothesis website and actually sign up for a Hypothesis account. I would say that it's also okay right now to be sitting with a, a, that whole feeling of like, uh, uh, what's happening? Um, it's it's um, it's just a stop on this the road. This will be the hardest part. Yeah, this will be this will be the toughest part. Once you've installed the extension and once you've created a hypothesis account on their website, but the extension itself, um, there's just a, a little um, icon. 
that sort of hangs out up here. Right up here, there's a tray, and on my Chrome browser, I've got about half a dozen things up here, but there's a little sort of uh, text bubble that you would see in old comic strips. Uh, that's what's up there. And when you click on that, it'll actually open the hypothesis extension in your browser. And you'll see a little arrow tab right there. And when you click on that, it'll open up a pane. Uh, you can kind of open it and close it. So let's try and get that part. Let's get everybody with the extension installed and signed up for a hypothesis account and then sitting on any page on the web uh, with, that, with that pane activated. And if we're there, we're ready to do the next stuff. We're, we're also going to talk about uh, the use of hypothesis in a uh, sort of specific um, pedagogical context. And, and here, maybe yeah. Jenna, if you would uh, talk about intergroup dialogue. Sure. Great. Sure. So as you, as everybody gets up and running, I think you know we wanted to also offer an example um, to begin to imagine how you might use this in your courses, or you might use this in um, in partnering with faculty as well. So as you um, get up and running, we want to switch gears a little bit to this sort of use. So you know, toggle back and forth between the sort of like, where am I? What is going on? Is it all working? Back to what are the possibilities, right? What are the affordances of something like a, an open annotation platform? So we began um, we began to integrate uh, uh, open annotation and hypothesis in, in particular into our inter, uh, an intergroup dialogue course um, at Muhlenberg. We are just beginning to sort of figure out where does where does shared annotation live? What are some of the spaces where it deepens learning, builds connections, helps students engage um, more thoughtfully with the text they might be incorporating. And our intergroup dialogue courses seem to be the perfect place to start that. They're half credit courses, um, primarily uh, dialogically based um, in class time, but they do lower stakes reading than maybe some of our other classes um, around you know, things like social identities and issues of access and equity. Um, they engage with both scholarly and blog posts and writings and you know the New York Times, other things that are happening online that are thinking about social identity. So it's a dynamic class that really seeks to sort of help students integrate um, their in-class time with what's happening out in the rest of the world. And so we thought this was a perfect opportunity to try something like a hypothesis and figure out, you know, can we bring these things closer together? Can we bring their in-class conversations closer together with the, the, with the text they're reading outside of class as a way of enhancing both, both spaces? You know, so when we think about intergroup dialogue and the model of intergroup dialogue, we're really looking for students to move from the sort of idea of debates, right? Debate and discussion, right? I have a point and I have to convince you that my point is correct um, towards a dialogic model where you're really trying to understand what is that person's experience, where is that person coming from, how is that person seeing the world differently than I am, which is sort of the complete opposite of how they engage online, right? So online, a lot of what we do when we're in conversation, particularly around things like social identities or difference in perspectives, equity and access, we're primarily arguing with people, right? We're not going like, I'm trying to let me understand, you know. That's not traditionally how we see or how folks experience interacting and engaging online. And so we were really looking at open annotation and shared annotation as an opportunity to try out these skills, to begin to enact these skills in online spaces um, in a way that's dialogic and less focused on sort of debate and discussion. When we began to, uh, to, to open the space, to open the, the outside of class space in, and, um, and open annotation, we were really actually quite surprised and pleased by what we, what we experienced and what we found students, um, what we found the conversations to be in hypothesis, 
over the text that they would have been reading. Generally, previously, we would have had them move into a discussion board, right? We would have had them move into a Canva, their LMS, post something in a discussion board. They would have been required to reply to that discussion, and we would have required that they write a post and reply to two people. Does that sound familiar to how we might use a discussion board? So, you know, so they would do this, and, 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 and they, there was a real disconnect then between the article that they were reading, the discussion board space, and any opportunities for a real dialogue in the discussion board over, around the text. They're, the students seem to just get very systematic, right? I understand discussion boards. I know what you're looking for. I'm going to quote this person. I'm going to bring this person in. I'm going to high five the person whose post I agree with most and be like, you're just smart. And then I'm going to go on my way and I should get full points for that. Open annotation forced them and complicated that a little bit, right? It forced them to, one, pick out the pieces that they were honing in on visibly um, in the text that they were reading, <coughs> to comment on that, to comment on that, and then engage in a conversation, hopefully in a dialogic conversation, around that moment. So all of a sudden, the things that tend to sort of be disconnected, discussion board here, article here, you know, discussion posts, you know, down below, um, or discussion responses down below, all of a sudden, it's all happening in one space. And so students are digging a little bit deeper. They're doing a little bit more. They're layering in, I think, uh, we thought, um, a little bit more of their own experience, but also challenging each other in a way that we hadn't found in the discussion board space. Because... In the discussion board space, it was like, yeah, I agree with your post, right? I agree with what you said. Here, it was like, oh, uh, that's an interesting way of looking at that. I hadn't read that that way. Actually, I was reading it this way. This is the way I interpreted it. Or I think that you're focusing on microaggressions in a way that I hadn't thought about or I hadn't experienced before. Here's how I see that. And, um, and all of this is happening over the text which we thought created a much richer conversation and an opportunity also for students to see where other students were finding meaning, where other students were sort of coalescing around an idea or an issue, or where they were in disagreement around an idea or an issue in a, in a much more deeper way than if you were trying to parse that apart on a discussion board. So in this sense, you know, we had students who were pulling the, so when you're in hypothesis and you're working in, um, in a shared annotation, you highlight the text and the text sort of comes up in a sort of grayish above and allows you to reply right there. So you have the text and what the person wrote, which you can see, and you'll see that in a second. You have the response, the student response, and then all the students who responded underneath all layered in together. So we see students begin to say things like, you know, the, the response about Ithaca striving for a diverse and welcoming community. The term diversity is a loaded term to me. Because diversity in color does not mean there will be an immediate integration of ideals and perspectives. How do colleges expect students to operate when they're thrown together in a compacted space of a college campus and actually be successful? So this is a student who's saying this. Another student says, you bring up a really interesting idea about, well, what diversity really means, right? And so all of a sudden, they're going like, I hadn't thought about things this way. I'm looking at things differently because of this. So this is, the, this is what we see as a possibility, shared annotation. So when we looked at hypothesis and interview dialogue, we saw a couple things that were particularly salient for us. Shared annotation permitted a form of dialogic interaction within the text. Not, not, I would, you know, not possible perhaps, or maybe not as feasible within discussion boards. Not as tangible within discussion boards. Group annotation spaces are similar to face-to-face -face IDD spaces. We were really asking them to take a topic, to take, to take stock of a reading or an idea or a moment in time and really think about how are we help, how are we seeing things? How are you opening your own sort of curiosity around how other people are seeing this topic or how other people are thinking about this as well? Students can practice IDD techniques and strategies within the readings. Again, I think that kind of we saw this as a kind of competency 
to figure out how do you engage across lines of difference, across across moments where you are you couldn't be further from where you uh, the person other person's perspective couldn't be further from where you are. How do you enact these kinds of behaviors online? Right? So it's one thing to do it in the classroom. It's one thing for us to be here in this space and have the ability to see each other's body language, to build that face-to-face -face connection, to respond, not just to what you're saying, but all of the other ways we respond to people's expressions and ideas face-to-face. -face. It's a very different thing to try to do that work online and explore ideas that tend to be, uh, that, that one tend to be sort of more, uh, driven by your own experiences and your own way of seeing the world, but also disconnected from the sort of humanity of the other person, right? They're just a name on a board. This opportunity kind of en encouraged the students to consider, are there ways, are there strategies, are there tools for building uh, space online that is more dialogic, that, uh, that invites students to think about and consider the perspectives of others in a way that we may not we not, may not have when we just sort of like refuse to like their post or muted them or shot off a passive aggressive post in response to their post. Is there a literature or an introduction to IGD? Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and so um, I'm, we're happy to share that as well on this on this document. There's a really um, couple page uh, piece about intergroup dialogue that we'll add to this as Great. well. Great, thank you. Facilitators can model intergroup dialogue techniques and have examples of student application of IGD techniques among annotations. So we were really looking at again the moments where you saw um, in the shared annotation space you saw students center around an idea and sort of coalesce around an idea, or the moments where they were completely not an agreement around an idea, and we were able to bring those into the classroom. We were able to engage those in the classroom. We were able to say, okay, so let's go back to this. What was happening here? What were you exploring? What was your perspective? What were you thinking? And that changed um, the conversation because, again, the, the discussion board, although effective, was really limiting in helping make that visible, make those sort of tension points or moments of connection visible. For us. And just, so part of your point, I want to make sure I understand, yeah. with a discussion board, the text that the student is inputting is separated from the text they're commenting on and that in and of itself, kind of like on a blog where you're just, you know, right. unless you have like a particular installation where you can comment mm -hmm. level. Right. So that's one of the big things. Right. right. So this allows it to happen over top and so you're able right. to read the text as you read the text, you're able to see what other people are saying and thinking. You're able to, to do these things at the same time. So a student may come in and two students before them may have already read the text. And so much like, um, you know, much like when you would do a group activity around an article, you're able to online begin to make visible what points are people taking away, what meaning are folks making. And it can inform the way you read, but it can also create space for you to push back and complicate perhaps a maybe more narrow perspective from a fellow student than, than you have, or a different perspective, and, and to complicate some of that as well. So one of the ways that I think you know, we're, going to, um, we're going to help imagine this is to do it ourselves, right? So it's one thing to say like, oh, we think this was great in this case, and here's some snapshots of what they said. But I think importantly, we want to try it in this space, in this community of learners. Um, figure out what's possible here in, um, in a space of shared annotation. If you, um, if you look on our uh, worksheet for today, you'll see this link allows you to join today's hypothesis group. I'll pull it up a little bit more. Uh, and, and just click on that. <clears throat> and I'm going to go into uh, the hypothesis website and one, one thing that we noticed, and we'll talk about this again in a little while, is uh, when you're working with students, mm -hmm. they tend to start their work in the public annotations. Mm -hmm. Hypothesis has the ability to annotate publicly, but they also have the ability to create groups and have group annotations. We felt for um, you know, the nature of an intergroup dialogue class on race that we didn't want to engage publicly. We wanted to have some boundaries around this online space where we were engaging. 
And if you start your work in the public area of hypothesis, it's nearly impossible to move your annotations into a group once you've done that. You have to recreate them. So this up here um, in the upper right hand corner is the groups tab. And if you click on that, if you've uh, joined the Blended Learning 2017 group, you'll see as folks do that, that all their names uh, start to appear here. Once you've joined the group with your hypothesis account created, um, all of these folks here have, um, have joined, and you'll notice that my name has one, uh, a number, a numeral one next to it. That means that I have one annotation uh, within the group. If you click on this here, unpacking terms around equity, power, and privilege, and then here's the URL that you can click, or you can visit annotations in context. There's this link right here. That should take you right to the article itself and have that hypothesis pane open so that we can begin working together to annotate um, Baha Mali's article. And if everything goes according to plan, she said she was going to try uh, to, to make it today too. So we'll see. Um, we're not holding her to it, but if she's able, she could, she could be here as well. That's, that's presumably the ballet person who's in the group? Or, 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 or we only see yeah. her if she's making No, she's joined the group as well. Yeah. Uh-huh, but we don't know if she's there. Right. Is well, that it? Yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, we don't, we don't know if she's online at the moment, but she is in our group. Yeah. And um, and she uh, left us a hello, uh, looks like. Hello and welcome. I hope you enjoy the workshop, and I will try to check in during and after to respond to annotations. Feel free to ask questions as well. So, um, and this is essentially um, how, how you would get your students set up. So you can see it's not an insignificant <coughs> amount of uh, overhead, right? Um, a lot of times I like to recommend that this kind of work happen outside of class. We either have digital learning assistants that we direct students to, or we try to prepare help materials or short videos to offload this kind of work outside of class. Our experience was it made sense to carve out the 10 or 15 minutes that we needed to at least get students to this point. Um, and you know, perhaps over time that'll improve as the interface makes um, you know makes improvements. But for right now, yeah. Uh, just wondering, I've, so I've explored groups in this before, but I'm just wondering how you created that link. I think that's really useful. Uh huh. So the the link to actually join the group and then. Because previously when I had done it, it, it sends an email to people, but having just the URL there. When you go to the Hypothesis website itself and look at your account in Hypothesis, invite new members, um, it gives you a link that you can copy. Right. And then that you can embed in a uh, uh, syllabus or an assignment in Canvas or, or however you want to do it. <laughs> Um, yeah, that is helpful. The emails get lost in yeah. spam blockers and stuff. I just wanted to ask whether or not you've already gone over um, any comparisons to other annotation tools. Like Nota Bene is one that I've used before, but this looks way more beautiful. And my question also was just, oh, can this do PDFs in addition to web pages? It, it, it can do PDFs. That is sort of a beta okay. feature. Um, and and I've played around with it with mis, mixed success. Um, and in a classroom, I, I haven't tried that yet. Well, we did it with our, I guess our DLAs, uh, our, our digital learning assistants. So, you know, caveat emptor. <laughs> um, we didn't talk too much about the current breed of web annotation tools. I mentioned medium.com has this feature sort of built into their blogging platform. Um, and there are about a half a dozen, I guess. Um, uh, I think the folks at Hypothesis are trying to build a culture around support for higher education. And um, But I, I'd be interested to try. Yeah, we're currently in their Canvas beta as well. Our team is in their Canvas beta, thanks to our other instructional technologist, Jordan. So we've been working closely with Hypothesis to try to refine and, and systematize and, and Integrate. So this is the one we're centering around, but certainly I think there are others that are emerging as well. There's one other feature of the of the interface that I want to point out, 
you'll see that there's a kind of an eyeball here, and then there's a, a page with a corner turned up there. This is uh, a way for you to see the group, because we've selected a group, uh, the annotations, and um, those will be visible to the group. If you highlight text, you'll see an option for two things. <coughs> There's the ability to annotate, and then there's also the ability to highlight. Highlights aren't shared. Thank goodness. Have you ever seen highlights? <laughs> <laughs> highlights are for you alone. But annotations within this group would be shared with one another, and we can comment and thread uh, uh, around specific annotations. And you would just click one of those two buttons to, to actually do that. The other thing I'd like to point out is these are the uh, annotations that folks make. But you can also make page notes, or I guess what would essentially be footnotes. Um, and those don't pertain to any specific selection. Uh, they, they just sort of collect at the bottom of the, the bottom of the scroll, I guess. So you can jump back and forth between those two. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, please um, read the article and uh, reflect on uh, what Maha has to say, and let's engage with one another around this topic uh, through hypothesis. And then you just want to make sure you're in the blended, you see blended learning 2017 yes. up at top. If you toggle that down, like Tim will right now, you see there's public, right? So that's the public space. Um, and public will make it visible to everybody, but won't be in this group. And so we wouldn't be able to see what you're up to. Or we could if we went to public. But let's say in Blended Learning 2017, so that we're in a closed group, this is only a conversation amongst the people in this room the, uh, and the author. Yeah. Um, and we're only folks who are in the group. We're going to return to this after we've all had a chance to read and annotate uh, and talk about that as we wrap up. When, uh, when Jenna says public is available to anyone, that means anyone who has installed a hypothesis extension and comes to this page would then see those annotations. And that may or may not be problematic, and we'll, we'll get to that. So that's why we're asking everybody to work just within our group right now. Another, another advantage of working in a group is you can't break anything. Just click away and loop around, and we're all friends. And Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Okay, so we're commenting on a blog post, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the things I would have my students talk, read, and then either talk about it or not, or post in some kind of online forum would be things that I've PDF'd into that blog. <coughs> so what kind of stuff can I use this on? Like, are there property rights? Like, how do I get, like, if I have a PDF of a journal article that I ask them to read, like, how could I, could they do that on, this on that? Yeah, Hypothesis intends to support PDFs, either those that are published open on the web or those that would exist within an LMS. Anything that has a URL, they're hoping uh, you can use the hypothesis extension to annotate a top of. So there could be something posted in my course Blackboard site that they could use this on? Um, theoretically. Okay. That feature is in development, and my experience um, is that it's sometimes kind of glitchy. Okay. But that's one of the things, if you look at their roadmap of the kinds of features that they're hoping to build, that's one of the things they really want to be able to do. And I think they feel that they have a proof of concept that they can get it to work, but they're still kind of working on their particulars mm -hmm. to make it a good experience every time. I have a follow-up question to that. So if you were on JSTOR and you chose the option that's just read full text instead of the PDF, is that a workaround? Or that's a great question. If you're already using a proxy to get behind a payload, you're not going to be able to use hypothesis because they're actually proxying too, right? They're prepending a URL just like a proxy, and you can only have one or the other. Um, so, yeah, we found that, you know, high-quality blog posts are really the sweet spot for the use of the hypothesis extension um, because... Uh, it allows for, for this kind of interaction without some of the technical stumbling blocks that we've experienced with other stuff. What about like newspapers? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, one might have to log into their own digital subscription. Um, but once you get through that, newspapers work great. Um, and I'll also say that if you can find an open access alternative to what's in a subscription database or journal, you're good to go because they're not proxying, right? So something like uh, No Paywall or uh, the OA button, any of those kinds of things, if you're intentional in selecting your materials for your course, you can get around the JSTOR kind of a problem. And that's also a plug for open access. So I am a librarian at heart. <laughs> so if I have a Word document, and if I saved it as a Google Docs document, could I then use Hypothesis with that Google Docs document? That's a good question. I've not done that. And we can goof around after and see if it works. Let's see um, it as a PDF. Yeah, potentially an uh, openly shared PDF would be no problem if it's stored in a Google Drive that's uh -huh. shared with the world. Right. That should work pretty well. I don't know specifically about a Google Doc, though. I'm, I'm thinking of using or the possibility of using Hypothesis as an alternative to the you know the track changes comment feature mm -hmm. for right. students who are doing peer reviews of one another's work. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that could work really well. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, let, let me go ahead and just, jump just, back. Just to follow that thought, because... Yeah. You know, one of the advantages of, of doing a peer review as a group is that I could say, well, I was really confused by this passage, and somebody else could say, really? I thought it was this, and they have a dialogue about it, whereas when you just do two peer reviews of the same article, the student who gets it can get completely opposite advice from the two people, and it would be great if the reviewers, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say thresh it out, but could at least comment on one another's sure. um, just a yeah. review of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific uh, a, a terrific use case. It sounds like we're already sort of connecting the dots. I I want to um, just very quickly show you if you roll through, um, and especially if you see this red arrow up at the top, that means that other activity is happening in real time. And if you click on that, it should refresh all the annotations and comments that people have made. And you'll see over here on the left, the yellow doesn't show up especially well through the projector, but you'll see where the activity is happening and you'll see the, the sort of interaction over here in this panel. If you go to the Hypothesis website and log in under your account, you can also see all of the activity around an article there. So um, it looks like some folks have uploaded images, which is awesome um, and totally supported. Uh, you can use this article to serve as sort of a hub and begin to layer in other hypertext references to things, which is another great way. And, and this activity actually um, is happening more and more. There's a project called the Marginal Syllabus, where they schedule week-long annotations around pre-selected articles, and members of the critical pedagogy community get together and actually work together through some of these things. Um, so it's a little bit of the flash mob mentality. Um, they just throw something out on Twitter and say, we're going to take a look at this, and uh, people join in. And, and obviously, that happens all within the public annotation, um, but it's kind of fun and kind of, uh, kind of maybe in a way of engaging uh, with students around, um, around a topic that is a little more uh, motivating than just a discussion board. And I think it's great that folks started using the um, use. Uh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Nope. Um, it's great that folks started to, so can you go back to the other, the one we were just in? Thank this you. Right the top tags um, feature, yeah. so folks were tagging um, their content as they went along here in this corner. And if there's, depending on the course you teach or depending on what you're hoping students get from that article, you may, you could even assign four tags, you know, and say, I want you to respond to these four things, and I want you to tag it appropriately so that we could, you would be able to then sort of synthesize and look at it um, in a stream. So you could, you know, choose diversity and look at things that way and really figure out where, where are the students, you know, struggling? Where are they connecting? What, you know, how could you dig a little deeper there? So the tags feature is great as well. So my is, oh yeah, I'm sorry. How would you see all the annotations by individual? Uh -huh. I'm clicking on the annotators list, and that didn't help. Can you, can you click on... Oh. There we go. 
So um, this bold list down here, um, oh yeah, that lets you give me a search tag. But <coughs> I think if you did it through this list and not the list over here to the right. Um, yeah, so you should run my article then. Yeah, and then you would click on the article and it will expand. So right, if you're thinking of looking at your students' work, that's exactly how you would do it. You would see, but not the bold list in the white. It would be the the other other list of hyperlinked uh, annotators in the gray. And then you would do one more click on the article itself, and it would bring up uh, bring up the the idea here is also that you're going to begin to layer in multiple articles for this group, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had seven readings assigned, for instance, um, that would show you not only this <laughs> individual's annotations around this article, but then the others would begin to lay down. Can you um, just pull in our IDD group so they can see them? Sure. <laughs> Right. So these so, were the four articles then that we integrated into the Enterprise Dialogue course that we ran, we piloted this with. So then you can see them all together and you can then parse out each article and then the students' contributions to each article, which we, we did have some expectations around their the social annotation piece. So we needed then when we were doing the grading, we needed to be able to sort of figure out what did they say? The one thing that we found as a limitation for this system is that in this space, you can't see the replies. Right. So we needed to go to the article and read down the list in order to see what students were replying to each other, because this is only showing us the primary annotation, not student replies to so that, that annotation. And so that we learned quickly when we were like, huh, what's going on? Um, so. Yay, and, and here's, uh, here's my um, she's a professor at the American University in Cairo, and I don't know what time it is for her over there, but she, <laughs> she is already. We yeah, she, we, we don't think she's <laughs> um, She's already jumped in and started engaging with our annotations around her article, which is another really exciting uh, possibility for for your own courses. Um, and and in the last few minutes that we have, um, I think I think I would like uh, to return to the pedagogy just a little bit. A few a few of the sort of specific lessons that we've learned is the Canvas integration needs more development. And I don't even think there is one for Blackboard. So um, working outside of the LMS is a real consideration. You can link back and forth between these things uh, through assignments and syllabi and things like that. Uh, we tried the Canvas LTI and, and we had mixed results. Tim, do you know if this has any integrations with Moodle? I don't. I don't. I don't expect it does. Um, but uh, I do think that the hypothesis community is very attentive to higher education, and they have a roadmap, um, and you can you can make those kinds of requests. Um, also, they uh, I'd say they lean toward open, <laughs> um, and it's possible that they even have stuff in GitHub that would permit developers to, to build that outright and then have it sort of merged in with uh, with the other code base for hypothesis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in-class walkthroughs we felt was worth the time. Uh, typically that's not our inclination. We like to offload all of that stuff, but um, at least for now uh, with the interface as it is, we felt that we really needed to do this kind of stuff with students to be able to walk around and make sure everybody got to specific milestones before they could, you know, complete the assignments. A low stake introductory assignment is a really good idea. So even if you just put something up that says hello world and it's a complete incomplete, it'll allow you to know that everybody was able to get over the technological hurdles and, and then the next thing can begin to be more meaningful and more or more engaged. Yeah, we definitely found that students, um, the first assignment, we were like, this isn't really getting where we wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they're not really engaging. And I think they were more like that, is, is this working? Is this, is anybody there? You know, and so you don't want that to be a graded assignment because that will just create one anxiety and it will make it really hard to grade because yeah. they, they seem to need that space. So one of the things I, 
think is most promising is this allows uh, instructors, facilitators to engage visibly in their own scholarly practice. These are things that need to be modeled for students. Um, that we talked a little bit about highlighting every sentence, you know, and and um, the, I guess the analog equivalent would be uh, having your students uh, annotate a top of a printed article and then collecting those to see how they're working through those and getting a sense of um, uh, how they're uh, making meaning out of the, the readings that you're assigning. This is a way to do that uh, <laughs> digitally, but it's also a way to insert yourself in this process um, so that they can see as a, you know, we're, we're no longer naive learners. Uh, they can see what we've done over time to develop these scholarly skills ourselves, these practices. Um, I mentioned earlier, this is a big caveat. Annotations are impossible, well, I'll say nearly impossible to move from public to a group. Um, and lastly, uh, there's there's actually been a lot of discussion on across the web and in, in Twitter around this notion of public annotation. There have been, I'd say, about a half a dozen blog posts. I annotate was a conference held recently in San Francisco around this whole notion of scholarly public annotation. Um, and there's a little bit of a debate over whether this makes sense or not, because we've seen successive waves of bad behavior as things uh, become popular on the web. It could be blog comments. A lot of people have disabled those because they just quite frankly don't want to hear it. Um, if you're not engineering and designing for uh, marginalized and oppressed groups, you're already inviting an opportunity for those people to be subjected to bad behavior, hateful behavior online. One way that Jenna and I believe we can uh, push back against this is to ask an author's permission, which is what we did today. We emailed Maya and we said, uh, we'd like to do this workshop. We'd like to talk about uh, matters of diversity and inclusion and intergroup dialogue, as well as social annotation, or we, I prefer to say shared annotation. I think it connotes a different kind of community building than social annotation, because quite frankly, the social web is not a place that I can spend <laughs> tremendous amount of time. Um, but shared annotation for me connotes exactly the right stuff. It's a way of engaging around a set of ideas and, and, and the author has the agency, right? They can say, no, I'd prefer not to do that. Or absolutely, I'd love to. Right. Or and anything in between. Right. Invite me in. Right. It also, I think, you know, humanizes the web a little bit, right? So oftentimes authors of the PDFs and the there's always there may be a select few that are field defining in our respective fields, but in general, those people sort of fall to the background, and it's their writing that we critique and we respond to, and and we write about in discussion boards and in our papers. But I think it's also a little bit of sort of humanizing the web. Who are these people? Who is Maha? She wrote this. She's one person. What is her location in the world? In this conversation? In this work? And students. I think you know that's an, another important reminder for students to think about, um, you know, the kind of work, the way you're re, you're repackaging or representing people's work, and thinking about who those folks are and and, and bringing them in where you can to the conversation. And and making a decision, a deliberate decision, um, to work within a group as opposed to um, on the public side of hypothesis. Um, you know, maybe overthinking it in certain circumstances, but we didn't feel around this topic in particular that it was. We, we felt that it was the right, the right way to go. One of the things that I hope the hypothesis developers consider is a way for educators through um, the extension uh, settings to turn off the public annotation option altogether. Because, you know, in the context of IGD, uh, if we're sending students to an article on the open web, uh, the last thing that we want them to see is uh, a whole bunch of hateful and hurtful things in the public annotations because we have to work to undo that a little bit um, to rebuild the trust and, and encourage the engagement that we're hoping to have within the face-to-face -face environment of an IGD dialogue. So, okay, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, yeah, and this is the part where I think we can just brainstorm until the end of how folks might Imagine using this in their own courses or supporting faculty. Can I take you back to the previous slide with a sure. couple of questions? Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to understand your last point. So, if there was an article that was on the web 
and some people have made public comments on it. If I then access it through Hypothesis, will I will those public comments be there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no way to zero those out and start afresh exactly. unless I take the article and post it myself somewhere else. No, no, no. You just need to move it into a group. You just need to be in a group. But the public is still there. Um, so so the public is always, the, that public link is always there where you can see what the public annotations are. As long uh -huh. as you move it into a group and you have that as a closed group, you are, you're working with a blank slate. Uh, okay. But students could always inadvertently or, or, or purposefully toggle to, to the open annotation. And again, this is a growing platform, but you know, that sort of running saying of like, you know, when you read the newspaper online, you don't read the comments. Right. Eventually, oh, Shared annotation, open shared annotation will be a little bit like that, particularly if you're working around contentious or topics where people's identities and value um, is being championed. We tend to find that folks who don't believe that aggregates to those spaces. And At the moment, you are absolutely correct. If there is something that is, so this is the Google homepage, google.com, mm -hmm. and there are 50 public annotations uh, well, five annotations, 17 page notes, and 10 what they call orphans. These are people who have created an annotation and they've canceled their account and deleted their hypothesis <laughs> account. You cannot control presently this, um, and that's one of the, the, the new features that I would like to see the hypothesis people uh, create is the ability through the group settings to say, yeah, just hide that public stuff altogether. Right. Um, because as you can see, this does not contribute any real value to the conversation um, at all. It's just you know, a bunch of silliness. And it could be even more, you know, hateful than that, right? So yeah. Um, and, and my other question is about sort of the notion of, of archiving. It's one of the hassles with an LMS is that all of the extensive notes you have in there tend to go away, right, when you now go to the next semester, or certainly when they go to the next version of whatever the LNS is, right? And presumably this will stay there as long as hypothesis stays there, right? If I made my notes in my freshman course, then as a senior I can get back to it, but that worries me because hypothesis may go away, right? right. Yeah, like how much how much stuff do people upload to Vine only to see Vine? With it, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, if, so, if you really want to move for our students from the world of printing out everything and making all those things to sing, this is truly my annotated version that I will then cherish. You need, you have, need to have a way of cherishing it, right? Absolutely. I mean, this really resonates with me. On the one hand, this is tremendously um, uh, promising because it allows you to get out of the silo, the silo of the LMS. Students can take this work with them. Um, they could create a private group that only they belong to, mm -hmm. and they could, you know, um, use this as one might an EndNote or some other uh, some other tool to annotate and to highlight around the readings that they find meaningful. Um, but and there is a way to export all of the stuff that you've done into an HTML file. So mm -hmm. um, at least you can now. How useful that is mm -hmm. is another question. Um, so I would say it's slightly better than the LMS because mm -hmm. when you graduate. You're done, mm -hmm. um, but not quite as empowering as say having your own domain where you you know can build these kinds of things for yourself. It's somewhere in between on that scale. That's that's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I am curious to. Uh, I'd like to stop talking. I'm curious. Um, I'm going to hand out stickers, and if anyone would like to sort of spitball ways they might use this, I'd love to hear that. So maybe could you go to the next slide? Yeah, I, said, I cut you yeah. off. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm Oh, so here's some of the ways that we imagined, but folks may have already used this in other spaces or be thinking about this in other ways. I think student digital scholarly practice was um, an important point, which is, you know, if students are peer reviewing or, or working collaboratively, how might, um, how might this be, a, you know, a possibility? Are there other questions or... Imaginings. Um, I got here late, so maybe this was the stuff before we got here. What is the importance of having this available through the LMS? Is it to protect students, or is there some other? We use Moodle, so yeah. 
There is, it's centralizing, right? So we always, you know, we are always looking to streamline. And so when students have to toggle out of the system and, you know, and um, toggle into another, remember passwords and those sorts of things, we tend to run into the, every time I talk loud, the computer shuts down and you're like, I don't know why, right? So that it, it's trying to streamline it, but it doesn't have a bet. It doesn't necessarily have a, it's not a critical importance. Jordan can add to that. I was just going to add that um, certain copyright issues. So if you're using a PDF from JSTOR that you downloaded, it's keeping it inside the LMS. Mm -hmm. um, that's what's nice about the Canvas integration is it's that it's allowing you to use PDF. Otherwise you'd have to upload it to a server making something public that otherwise, you know, is behind a paywall, U.S. integration community um, available. So that's kind of what I've been. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts? We had a lot of success with faculty learning communities and hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So um, things that are mostly asynchronous um, and uh, folks who are already um, uh, are self-motivating and you know uh, do the reading and do the work. Uh, we found that it worked really, really well as a way of um, sort of uh, offloading a little bit of that. So that when we did have time face to face, everybody already kind of was um, at the same place. That was that was good. Um, and we thought about co-curricular uh, experiences. A lot of our resident assistants do things like portfolios and stuff like that. So. Um, the opportunity for them to work uh, across <coughs> assigned readings from residential life and things like that um, is another another idea. Because what we tend to do is create fake classes in the LMS to pull that kind of engagement together. Has anybody seen that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? So this is a way to uh, potentially avoid that altogether. We could just work within a hypothesis group and not need to create a fake course uh, to avoid people. And we really are focused right now on integrative learning, moving from what we were calling clusters, which were courses that students enrolled in in sets. I don't know if other institutions, well, we've, we've, we have lots of funny sayings for what clusters became, but, <laughs> um, but, um, but really thinking about integrative learning and helping students, particularly at liberal arts colleges, make connections across those, across courses and across majors and from, um, and from many different areas. And so thinking about integrative learning and co-curricular experience and, and, and the ways that we might be able to, uh, to make more visible some of the content. So if students were, um, were able to say, in a class that was either team taught or collaboratively or interconnected in some way, the faculty member might members might choose to use hypothesis and then they would be able to see what the other what the other class and what the students in that other class were annotating were saying how what they were reading and how they were reflecting on that to weave that into their own course and so departments may also choose to use this as a way of connecting the dots over the courses instead of um, and you know or at least facilitating a little bit more some of that connection I'm sorry to bring up a negative yeah. sure mm -hmm. but um, some of our students and faculty as well have resisted annotating online longer material because they say I don't like reading it on the computer. <laughs> it's out. It's, mm -hmm. So then they print it out and they hand mark up and then they go back and type in what they wrote by mm -hmm. hand. And so I'm curious if you had a similar experience or any other thoughts on the solution. We've yeah. tended to report <laughs> these some of the material and, and not include those. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's you know um, I don't think that this is necessarily the solution to every uh, to everybody. Um, we we have an ongoing sort of a perennial discussion about uh, memory retention, paper versus digital in our institution. And um, you know, speaking for myself, I try to be sensitive to that all the time. Um, I would say if the article is too long, don't use hypothesis. Um, and, and maybe there are other ways in which folks can find to work together around things. But, you know, journal clubs are, are awesome because, you know, it's been happening forever and maybe you just don't try to improve on that. You know? Which students will 
Yeah, so students so students really found this valuable and I think um, enriching, right? They, they seem to like this way of doing it. They felt like it was more dynamic than the discussion boards. And I also think students just are really kind of exhausted by discussion boards as well. They're, they tend to be as um, a mainstay in a lot of courses for people who use the LMS to, to manage their course. And so this, uh, this was more dynamic. This changed the pace a little bit, allowed them to interact. But I also think for the students that we saw, um, they seemed to feel like it deepened their it deepened their thinking around the text because they it, they felt like those things were working together. Because I think we, I, sometimes in my experience, I think we assume that students at this age, at this time, are like totally technically literate, and they're they're not. Right. And they this kind of stuff, in my experience, makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. As I'm sitting there, like wondering, well, I'm trying to figure it out myself. Like, so there wasn't that resistance, or was there? Oh, oh, yeah. okay. And that's why we had the low stakes assignment. We learned yeah. that lesson. I would say they came to like it. Okay. I would say they liked <laughs> yeah, it right out of their enough, shoes. Yeah. yeah. We had to sit with that a little bit. Okay. But once we got past it, it, it was really worth it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much.